need to take a breath. So I invite you to take a couple of deep breaths. <laughs> and then I'll begin the reading from Emmett Fox. Which is titled, One Thing at a Time. <laughs> the present moment is never intolerable. It is always what is coming in five minutes or five days that makes people despair. The law of life is to live in the present. And this applies to both time and place. Keep your attention to the present moment and in the place where your body is now. Do a fair day's job and then stop. Overwork is not productive in the long run. A friend of mine was visiting a great cathedral in Italy. And just inside the door was a magnificent mosaic extending the width of the building, but not yet completed. It represented the last judgment and the number of tiny pieces of different colored marble involved in it staggers the imagination. A man was on his knees working away and my friend who spoke Italian whispered to him, what a stupendous task you have. I could not even dream of undertaking so much work. The man replied quietly, Oh, I know about how much I can do comfortably in one day. So each morning I mark out a certain area and I don't bother my head thinking outside of that space. And before I know where I am, the job will be complete. A, a short uh, reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. One thing at a time. Thank you. So we're continuing the discussion of 21 Ways to Build a Stronger Spiritual Life based on a writing by Victor Perichin. And uh, we're about to start with number nine, but let me quickly hit the uh, highlights or the headers for the first eight uh, so that you can sort of see the, uh, or experience the sequence. One is be a river, not a swamp. Two is identify your blessings. Three is be like Moses, speak words of blessing. Four is nurture a shared spread, uh, let me try again, nurture a shared prayer life. Five is take a step of faith. In other words, don't wait until everything appears ready, move in the leading. Six is restore someone's faith. Seven is be a grateful person. Eight is share your journey or share the journey with someone else. In which case they're talking about having someone you share spiritual thoughts, spiritual growth with. So we come to number nine, which is Serve, and I'm going to read what Perichin wrote first. Look for ways to serve the community, especially tasks that promise no reward, such as picking up litter on the streets. And then he suggests that we read and reflect on the actions of Jesus in John 13, 1 through 5, which I will now read to you from the Lamsa translation. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew the hour had come to depart from this world to his Father, and he loved his own who were in this world, and he loved them unto the end. During supper, Satan put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon of Iscariot, to deliver him. 
But Jesus, because he knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, and that he came from God, was going to God. He rose from supper and laid aside his robes. He took an apron and tied it around his loins. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples and to wipe them with the apron which was tied around his loins. I would say that this is comparable to picking up litter on the streets. It is not the sort of thing where the spotlight's going to shine on you for being such a great person. Um, as we look at this and think about this, I want to remind you of the metric that I hear from so many atheists um, as, the, as sort of their mantra, their ethic in going through life, which is the goal that they will leave the world a better place for their having passed through. So it's a self-directed goal, just as picking up litter is self-directed. You're not looking for someone to make note of you or feature you in a newspaper. Um, you're not expecting when you're picking up litter that the earth's going to come out and say thank you, or even anybody else is. But you are serving. You're working to make the world a better place. You may be happier too, because when you look back, you see a cleaner path or a cleaner sidewalk than when you walk through it. So that's, that's something internal. It's not, you're not doing it for tra uh, transactionally or seeking acknowledgement for it, your praise from the outside. Um, it's harder when you're thinking of what can you do to serve for other people because it's much trickier because you're likely to get praise. And then, so then you have to think, well, am I doing this because the world's going to be a better place or am I doing this because people are going to think better of me or I'm going to get noticed uh, or I'm going to get thank yous. Um, you know, the difference again between self-driven serving and serving to get something. Um, for instance, are you working in the soup kitchen, volunteering in the soup kitchen, so that you can help the homeless, the poor, get a good meal once a day? Or because of the thank yous you'll receive for doing it. The difference between being in the back room in the hot kitchen peeling potatoes or scrubbing the cooking pots versus being out on the serving line. Here, let me give you some of this. Let me give you some of this. Um, and bear in mind also that the time you're giving service can also be a time of meditation, of communion with the divine within you and around you. Um, Consider the writings of Brother Lawrence in that regard. Uh, he wrote about how so much of his spiritual time, his time with the divine, or in more modern language, perhaps meditating or communing with the divine, was while he was cleaning uh, the kitchen's cooking pots uh, in the order, the monastery where uh, he lived and worked. And later on, I presume, though I have not read his commentary there, when he was a sandal maker, when he was disabled enough, he could no longer stand. He was a sandal maker. Well, it was the same thing. Simple work, work making something better, but also a time for his own spiritual thoughts or experiences. Now, I've sort of, this one was a difficult one for me to look at and figure out what to say. Um, it took a while to come together, and then I started thinking, well, what would you define as, uh, say, world improvement, earth improvement activities that one could do that don't necessarily involve people, so that you, 
if you are, could be freer of the risk of wanting to do it for acclimation. Uh, you know, things like keeping a hiking trail clear of poison ivy and weeds, um, fostering shelter animals, uh, or helping them heal from abuse so that they can be ready to find a forever home. Um, uh, just volunteering at a pet shelter. Uh, the no-kill shelters are often desperate for people to come in with the goal of just giving each animal some attention, which they so badly need. Um, volunteer at a library or a hospital, doing things the staff cannot would be possibilities. Or if you're wanting to work with people, um, well, an exception, I don't know if it's an exception, uh, I met a fellow who'd, uh, who'd quit going to school at Miami University to go to the Cincinnati Mortuary College, and I asked him why he'd made the change. And he told me, well, I realized I've always wanted to work with people. That kind of person, I don't think you have to worry about getting praise from. Uh, but here are some ideas of ways you could help people if you wanted to work with people and were willing to do it without seeking acclimation. Um, you could drive the car list to medical appointments or even get groceries. Um, as I mentioned earlier, assist at a food bank or, um, or a soup kitchen. Join someplace like Habitat for Humanity or any of the other organizations that report, repair buildings or build new buildings for the homeless. You could become an advocate for a child in the welfare system. They're always needing that. Uh, you could deliver meals to the homebound. I know someone who does that. Uh, I also know someone who, in the tax time, uh, spends many hours a day helping seniors and the poor figure out how to return, how to fill out the tax forms and to make sure they get everything back that they could. And something else, if you have an emotional support pet, one that's been authorized, you could take it to nursing homes, to schools, to hospitals, to help people there feel better and get well. So there's many possibilities. The key is to look in yourself and determine the why of your doing, your motivation. So that you can, if I can put it this way, so you can serve purely in divine love and in the interest of divine well-being on this earth. Uh, number 10 is cultivate a little solitude. And Perichin writes, Solitude makes us tougher toward ourselves and tenderer toward others. Um, and this is a quote, um, I'm sorry, I cut the quote off. Solitude makes us tougher toward ourselves, tenderer toward others, in both ways it improves our character, says um, the philosopher Nietzsche. And Perichin says, spend some time away from the crowd and the noise of life. Set aside a few minutes to be alone, just you and God. In quietness, we turned our minds away from the problems of life and fix our thoughts on the mind of God. And um, this fits with something that uh, Gordon MacDonald, the, uh, the writer of the book, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Mm -hmm. um, Strengthening Your Inner Life, I believe it's called wrote about how easy it is in the din of day to day and the pressures of being a minister to let yourself fall away from your connection with God. And he spoke about how every morning he set a time in his calendar, if I recall it was from 6 to 7, or it may have been 5.30 to 6.30, to spend time with God. Nothing got in the way of that. No one met with him. That was the way he carried his commitment for solitude and for building. Uh, and this is also cultivating a little solitude. Going back to Brother Lawrence, um, you can find your solitude peeling potatoes, washing dishes, cleaning your house, uh, sitting silently in your chair in a silent house or in a church, if you know one that has open doors during the day, or at the Old Park Overlook. Um, when I was in high school, 
I, there was no such thing as solitude in my dysfunctional family home. So some nights, dark nights, damp, I would walk the half mile to a park right on Lake Erie. It was a park that ended in the cliff over the lake. So you couldn't get to the lake, but you could hear the waves crashing in the dark against that cliff. And you'd see the fog rolling up over the cliff in waves and come past you. And there was a, a chair there, a bench, actually a rocking bench. And I would sit there and just soak up the silence and soak up my connection with the divine. I felt utterly at peace there. And this is part of your goal in cultivating your solitude, to become at peace with the solitude, to allow your internal God, peace of God to connect with everything else of God in a wordless way. Um, now, I know of others who've erected altars uh, in their homes or apartments you know, there's no required place for you to do this. Uh, well, I don't know that I'd suggest sitting, uh, sitting and saying a mantra in the middle of a four-lane highway. Yeah, I don't think that would work out very well. Um, but if it's a place that works for you, gives you the solitude without interruption, and allows you to strengthen or broaden your connection with the divine. That's what it's all about. Number 11 is fast and pray. And Perichin writes, prayer linked with fasting was often done by people in the Bible. Ezra 8.23 reports, quote, so we fasted and earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us and he heard our prayer." End quote. So Periton writes, the next time you are asked to pray urgently for someone in difficulty, consider combining your prayer with fasting. And as I read this, it, it gave me pause. Because um, yeah, I could see so many ways that this could be misinterpreted, I guess would be the way. Uh, are you going to fast in a, tra in a transactional way with God? God, I'm going to fast. I'm going to things make things uncomfortable for me. In return, I'm going to trust that you're going to do this. Well, that's exactly the kind of relationship with God that we really don't want to pursue. Because then it's just a business deal. Instead, consider that fasting is a way of stripping away earthly distractions, considerations in an, a fairly intense way so that you can allow yourself a broader path of connection with the divine within you and around you. Uh, now the physical aspect of fasting that is common is that you will refrain from ingesting food for a period of time. And this is a common tradition among many of Earth's religions, including, of course, Christi excuse me, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Mormons, and Baha'i. And Baha'i teachings uh, say that the Baha'i fast symbolizes detachment from the physical world, uh, that it allows one to develop empathy for the poor and the hungry and engenders uh, growth of the soul. And in what I read about it, uh, it is said the Baha'i fast exists primarily for the benefits conferred on the human spirit. It becomes a period of spiritual recuperation for refreshing and invigorating the soul. Uh, now, in Baha'i, they have a period in March, if I remember, it's from the 1st of March to um, the solstice, um, when they fast for 12 hours a day. Uh, in, the, in Islam, it's the, uh, the month of Ramadan, or the, the period of Ramadan, when it's 30 days from sundown, sun up to sundown, you eat nothing, if you are healthy enough to do this. Um, it brought to mind, I experimented with fasting when I was in college. As I and several other Quakers decided 
to see what the experience was. And for five days, we did a total fast aside from drinking liquids. Um, and I was amazed at the shift in my ability to focus and stay focused on my studies. In one case, I remember working on a paper and I sat in the same place working on the paper. I think it was for eight or 10 hours, period. And that was far beyond anything I've ever accomplished before or since. Um, but by the fourth day, my body was getting really shaky. And nowadays, if I don't ingest enough in one, in one day, I get really shaky. So that's, that's a problem I have to deal with. Um, but I want to also suggest that food fasting is only one of several fasting possibilities. Uh, and it may be appropriate to consider another one or consider several of them. Um, so here are some other possibilities. Uh, fasting from electronic communications. Fasting from electronic devices in total. Abstaining from using vehicular transportation. Abstaining from human interaction, uh, becoming a temporary hermit. Uh, when you when you go on sojourn, when you go to those um, uh, gatherings at the monastery, what I've, I've forgotten the name. Monastery. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Well, they're silent. They can be silent retreats. Silent retreats. Okay. So let's forget about hermit. I knew there was another name in it. Uh, so consider a silent retreat, whether an organized one such as Phyllis does or one of your own. Uh, there are even I'm aware like cabins you can go in the middle of nowhere and be there all by yourself in the woods. Uh, and another possibility is temporarily abandoning your current life to go on a pilgrimage. Uh, the, uh, the El Camino Real in Spain, for instance, uh, I think that's like a two-week slow walk uh, in prayer from one part of Spain visiting uh, religious sites on the way to another part. Consider the options. Consider when to do it. Now, I will say, Sister Pepper always said, don't keep praying or worrying. We're going to get to worrying in a minute. Um, because God hears you the first time. So, my suggestion is, if you're going to fast, don't spend 12 hours. I, I remember Oral Roberts wrote in one of his books about he, how he prayed from sundown to sunup over some, some sick child, and lo and behold, the child recovered. But Sister Pepper would have said, don't you have the faith that just telling God once is enough? Well, in your fasting, you're going beyond that to create a more or allow a more intense relationship with the God that is you and that is everything here. And if you're adding prayer to it, great. But don't feel that you need to pray for all 12 hours that you're fasting or anything like that. And then number 12 is turn your worries over to God. And Perichin writes, this is a clear teaching of scripture, quote, Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. And he says, do this each time a worry creeps up. Now, the alternative to that is what Ro the late Robert Schuller called stinking thinking. And uh, a good example of that is when one finds oneself being called a worry wart. Uh, when you keep resurrecting the worry you have, you are denying for yourself the access to divine answers, the solutions that are yours by divine right, because you are of the divine, and because, as part of the divine, good is your inheritance. Good is yours automatically. But if you keep concentrating on the toxic, you're blocking. Uh, Raymond Fox talks about this too. Um, and, you know, the, the biblical quote, which comes thousands of years before Jesus the Christ arrived, uh, is the same as Emmett Fox. And it's easy to say, 
give up your worrying. It's far more difficult in practice. But Fox says essentially, place your problem before God. Make your prayer, or your treatment as he would call it, and then stop worrying. And Sister Pepper would always say, don't pet your problem because it keeps giving it energy. You only need to say your prayer to God once. Don't say it over and over. Don't think about the problem anymore. Because to do otherwise is giving the power to the problem, not to God. We thank you, God, for having given us the spiritual family to share with, to walk with, to pray with, to laugh with, to support. We thank you for having brought us together today to where we can share our wisdoms and each grow further, closer to you, more broadly in you and of you, and allow you to grow that spirit within us ever more fully. We thank you for watching over us, guiding our feet as we depart from here. Help us to understand what we're to do, where we're to do it, to be in your service. Help us to grow in understanding from what we've discussed today so we come back even more wise. And we thank you for guiding us back as soon as possible so we can share and grow together. For all the good, dear God, we say thank you, thank you, thank you, and amen. amen.